Hey everybody, can you guys hear me now? Sounds like I wasn't live for a minute and I thought I was. Uh, I was on a different... Um, I was on a different uh, software that I've been using and I don't know if you can actually hear and see me. So let me know if you can actually see and hear me. Sounds like I uh, was supposed to be live, but apparently it wasn't showing up on YouTube. So let me know if you guys can hear me now. You guys, uh, can everybody hear me and see me okay? My volume all right? Okay, great. I was actually like starting this live for like 10 minutes and I thought I was already live and apparently I was just doing it for myself. So that's awesome. I'm already like three quarters of a beer down almost. So I'm drinking a raspberry sour. I was kind of wondering why no one was commenting and I was like, boy, everybody's a little uh, quiet tonight. So Appreciate you guys jumping on. What's everybody drinking tonight? Uh, I know Charles had said, and I mentioned this earlier, Denver Broncos lost, so did the Vikings, so I'm right there along with you, man. Hey, hello from Australia. Awesome, man, cool. What's everybody drinking tonight? Everybody have a good weekend? Anything cool happen that I'm going to be jealous about? <clears throat> bitter tears from losing your Bronco the Broncos losing is that what you mean <laughs> awesome awesome um, well tonight I was already kind of showing off some of the DIY equipment and I was apparently I was just doing that for myself so tonight we're actually gonna be talking about some of my DIY equipment we're gonna be going through um, you know, how to make a mash tun. Uh, I do a recirculation tool that I did myself, DIY. I have a jockey box that I'm gonna be using uh, and I use for a couple events every year to keep your beer cold while you're uh, serving um, off-site uh, so you don't need a refrigerator or anything like that. Basically just ice. I have a kind of a uh, cold crash guardian and a hop spider that I've made. And I also have a keg and carboy cleaner. So if there are um, anything that you guys wanna see or hear about first, we can go ahead and do that, uh, but uh, we're going to go through a little bit and touch bases on all that kind of stuff. But I'm glad you guys are commenting now because I was before I was like, why isn't anybody commenting? I see some people that are kind of waiting, but uh, apparently I was just sitting here talking to myself. 8.30 a.m. does mean coffee, so um, uh, unless you're like an overnight worker or something like that, then you deserve a beer. But uh, yes, coffee would probably be a lot better that time of day. For me, it is... Uh, 8.30 at night, and therefore, I will have a beer for you. If you guys didn't see my last uh, live last weekend, I talked about building a recipe a little bit. And so, um, that one is really, really cool. We talked about, you know, going through, actually doing water additions, all that kind of stuff. If you're not familiar with that, go check it out. Um, that was a really fun uh, night. Um, this week, I brewed a pumpkin ale. So... I brewed one that has a little bit different spices than you'd normally see in a pumpkin ale. I don't like a, a beer so much that really tastes just like, you know, pumpkin by like a, you know, like a, like a dessert. I want to actually like feel like I'm having a beer and if there's some pumpkin flavor or some spices in there, great. Uh, but I want to have more than one of them. So I, if there, if it's too sweet and too overly spiced, um, then I'm going to go ahead and just, um, only have maybe one of those or not at all. So when I'm brewing one myself, I'm, I actually uh, brewed a beer, which I filmed, and that's why I have all the Halloween decorations up behind me. Um, I have uh, that beer coming out in a couple of um, couple of weeks. That one will be up. I'm going to do a true kind of grain-to-glass video for that so I can kind of go over the different spices that I used. That one, again, I didn't use any... Um, vit or, uh, I didn't use any cinnamon or nutmeg. I used four different other spices, but I uh, kind of tamed down the spices and, and uh, added some uh, roasted pumpkin, which I think turned out really good. And then for the mash, it's, or uh, for the uh, grains, I used, a, I used a Vienna Special B and some Munich malt uh, to give it some kind of raisiny flavor, but still have some, um, still have some, uh, 
amber. It feels like I'm drinking like an amber ale, but will with some pumpkin and some spice flavor. So that'll be pretty good. When do you do a hazy IPA? Uh, I do hazy IPAs all the time. So uh, there's that one on my channel for uh, uh, the award-winning one I did uh, not too long ago. I'm actually going to be brewing up another one. Uh, we did a, uh, a, in my beer club, we did a um, fantasy draft where we actually draft ingredients. And one of the things that I uh, drafted was ingredients to get uh, a hazy. So we got most of the stuff. We didn't get everything I really wanted in the uh, draft because once an ingredient is gone, you can't pick it, right? So I don't have any, like, uh, you know, oatmeal uh, and stuff like that. So I would need to uh, make it hazy other ways. We got white wheat and other things going on there. Cheeseology with Adam is on. So Cheeseology, uh, as a friend of mine, he's named, his name's Adam. Hopefully I'll have Adam on maybe one time to do a little cheese and beer pairing session. He can come on, come on over and we can kind of talk about something a little less beer related, but he does uh, beer brewing and he makes his own cheese. And so he's gonna be starting a channel, uh, Cheeseology. So you guys can check that out if you're interested in learning how to make cheese. But I roasted the pumpkin in the oven. I did three pounds of it. Um, I roasted about 350 for about 15, 20 minutes or so, um, just to get kind of caramelize some of those sugars a little bit and roast it. And then I put all that in the mash. So you'll see that on the video when I, when I uh, post that. Um, what else? Other than I'm trying to forget about football today because the Vikings suck, even though I'm going to the Vikings game next weekend. Um, but at the same time, um, I'm hoping to get an actual win out of it rather than them continuing to uh, shoot themselves in the foot and uh, they are not 0-3, so that's not great. But whatever, we're trying to figure that out. I figured as this, uh, we're also starting this DIY video that we're going to be, uh, this shirt was very appropriate because, you know, it's going to, it's the DIY shirt, not a drill. So what's everybody else drinking? Anybody uh, having a beer with me or is it just uh, me and uh, and Charles having a coffee? <laughs> Anybody uh, brew anything cool over the next couple weeks? With that, I'm gonna get a beer. So yeah, good question. I'm not doing a live next Sunday because I'll be going to the uh, because I'll be going to the game, and so I won't be going. I won't be doing a live next Sunday, but I will the Sunday after. So I'm going to skip a week next week. Uh, we'll we'll be back doing a different live um, two Sundays from now. But uh, this Sunday I'll do one. Of course, I'll do one now. Not going to do one next Sunday, and then uh, doing the uh, live the weekend after. So let me know if you guys have any topics you want me to talk about. Happy to. You know, really take suggestions. And again, as always, ask any questions that you have in the chat. Happy to answer anything just kind of on the cuff. This is what it's supposed to be all about is having fun, having a beer, talking about different stuff, and answering your guys' questions. So having a all Azaka IPA. I love Azaka hops. I have a lot of those in the freezer behind me. Unforeseen IPA. Nice. Switch to Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. That is the godfather of pale ale, so that is a, a good one to have. One thing that I, I talked a little bit, I think, about uh, last week, we, we kind of um, talked about Sierra Nevada's pale ale and how to like, switch it up uh, for the recipe, but I did a, uh, a clone of their a celebration ale, which should be coming out you know, in the next couple, couple of months. One of my favorites all-time beers. It's really good. Excuse me. Made a beer for your homebrew club with uh, frozen waffles and maple syrup with Pilsen malt. Nice. That sounds good. I uh, So for this uh, last competition we did, and I'm actually editing a video for it right now, we went to uh, our beer and branding uh, event, and we had to showcase a beer with maple syrup. So check that out. It is going to be on uh, my YouTube channel this week. I'm just literally editing it right now, and you will find out how we did. Adam helped me brew that from Cheeseology. So... Um, we won't give away uh, that, but you should definitely watch the video because uh, that was a sweet event, something very, very fun. Just kegged a German Pilsner, was surprised that fermented, had an issue with fermentation in the fridge and it froze solid. Wow. Was that after uh, fermentation was complete? I hope. That would have killed all the yeast, so you don't have to worry about any live yeast.
But you said if you were surprised it fermented because you you had an issue in the fridge and it froze solid. It sounds like before or during fermentation, huh? Hardy yeast if it froze and it's still uh, fermented. That's crazy. Crashing a Kolsch at 38 for three weeks. Awesome. I love a good Kolsch. Not, not going to lie. I, I don't brew Kolsches. Or I don't, I've never brewed a Kolsch, to be honest with you. Um, but I like a Kolsch when I can get one at a, at a brewery or somebody else brews a good one. All right, I'm going to grab another beer. Um, if you guys have questions, and then we're going to get right into the DIY stuff. So we'll go ahead and do that. If you guys have questions or comments, uh, leave them in the description. I am going to go for a probably an ESB. Actually, I might do my Smash Cascade. But we can talk about that just halfway before I uh, start with the DIY stuff. But Jim got my stickers. Awesome, man. You appreciate it. Yes, no problem. I love sending them out. Again, if anybody else wants stickers... I have some. You would just have to email me. Uh, you can email me at uh, cityscape, or, uh, yeah, cityscape brew at gmail. Not brewing, but cityscape brew at gmail. Just send me your name and address. I'll send you a few of them in the mail. Uh, if you have stickers you want to send back, let me know. Uh, I can. Uh, I always like throwing some on my uh, keys or two. So feel free to do a little swap. Let me go fill this up. Froze the first few days. Finished at uh, 4.9 with 10.10. Wow, not bad. For freezing beer, you should name that something like the Arctic or something like that. That's crazy. That it's still fermented out after you were like frozen solid. That's crazy. Bruna Schwartz beer, roasty lager. Nice. Uh, Schwartz beer. Do you put real Schwartz in it? No, I'm just kidding. Schwarzenegger? Like Arnold Schwarzenegger? Albu beer. So this is that couple of live videos again. I did that smash cascade. This one turned out pretty good. This was for a education event that we're doing at my homebrew club. Um, where we're picking different ingredients and changing one thing. I probably wouldn't brew this specific one ever again, only because I like a little more body than just the regular two row malt. And so you can always uh, um, add like a little extra crystal something or other in there to give it a little bit more color, a little bit more body. I don't mind using like Cascade hops or even the you know USO5 that I used, uh, but I would not probably just use always um, two row. A good smash uh, malt, though, is Maris Otter. It does have the body, and if you just have that in a, uh, a beer, it's not too bad. But in this particular case, I would probably just brew a, um, you know, a two-row with some extra you know, Crystal 60 or something in it, some honey malt or something else, just to give it a little bit extra something-something. May the Schwartz be with you. I like it. All right. So I'm going to get in. I'm going to show um, the DIY equipment. I'll uh, start with, I know one person was really interested in the mash tun itself that I made. We'll talk about the recirculation tool just because that has something to do with mash anyway. And we'll jump right into it. But if you have questions as we're going, uh, let me know. I've also put everything we're going to talk about tonight in the video description below. So all the videos where I actually made these things are actually in the video description. Also, I have an Amazon store in there too. The Amazon store has everything that you'll need to make those things. And sometimes I've categorized them into fermentation or into kegging or into, you know, the mash tons, items, that kind of stuff. So look at, uh, through that um, and uh, let me know if you guys have any questions as we're going through it. Smoked honey thinking of making a porter. I don't know if I've had a porter with smoked honey in it. That sounds good. I don't know if I... Uh, I guess the smoky flavor would be in there. I don't know about the honey flavor in a porter. It could be it could be good in a small amount maybe, uh, but but like smoked malts and stuff would be good. All right, without further ado, let's get on the the mash tun. So, a lot of people when they first get started brewing, they start wanting to do all or excuse me, all grain brewing. They need a mash tun, and a lot of people it's very common to get something like a Rubbermaid uh, ten gallon uh, cooler like this one, so you can get it uh, from you know hardware store you can get it from amazon you can get it wherever but it's basically going to come with 
you know, a lid like this one. It's going to come with a little spigot on the front. And sometimes it comes with like a little glass holder or something like that on the side. But in this case, I've replaced the little spigot with a ball valve, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But normally it has a little plastic white, you know, tab thing. And you're basically filling it up with, you know, water, ice drinks, whatever, and, and using it on to keep things cold. And this does a really good job, and I think why a lot of people use this still for beer brewing is it does a really good job uh, of, um, of actually keeping items cold for a long time. It's, you know, thick-walled styrofoam in the middle and, and hard plastic and that kind of thing. And the fact that um, it can hold temperature for a really long time is why people kind of prefer to use something like like this, excuse me, for a mash dome when they first get started. When you're using like a like an all-in-one system, electric system, you know, propane, gas, that kind of thing, you have to have it going all of the time in order to keep a, a temperature up. You know, not very high, but you need to kind of regulate temperature. In this case, when I add something to this, it actually holds the temperature pretty, pretty well for, you know, the whole entire hour. I might drop maybe a degree or two if this thing isn't super cold or something like that. Like in the winter time, now if this is very cold, um, I put a little bit of boiling water in there to kind of preheat the inside of this thing so it doesn't affect the temperature of my mash. But it, as long as you do that in the winter time, um, this thing even will brew, you know, it'll hold the temperature for the entire hour uh, almost. So I don't have any issues with it holding temperature and that's one of the reasons why I haven't really gone away from using uh, this Rubbermaid cooler. So let's talk a little bit about the inside. You have a little bit of options when it comes to the inside of a mash tun. You can either use a, a screen like I have called a bazooka screen, which I'll show in a second, or they have what they say, the false bottom, which is kind of like a, a plate, you know, circular plate that has a bunch of holes in it. It has a, you know, generally a hole in the middle that leads to a tube that leads to this ball valve on the outside. And again, this ball valve is just where, you know, you have, you open and close it to let out your wart after you you know get done so you open that and close it you can this this spigot you could either have you know a barb you know uh, nipple like this one or you can use like cam locks or you know other quick connects that kind of thing so that's kind of optional but the ball valve um, you're going to need on the outside of that and then you're going to need something on the inside and so what i use is what they call a bazooka screen and so you can kind of see here that i have a 12 inch bazooka screen it, it kind of barely fit in the thing so I had to bend it just a little bit at the end that's not a big deal I had a six inch version of that before and I upgraded just to get a little bit more surface area and but either one would work in this type of scenario so the six inch was fine this one just uh, the recirculating with the 12 inch just gave it a little bit more surface area around the screen to build up and uh, helped move it a little bit faster so in this case um, I like the bazooka screen option a little more than the false bottom because I don't have to take it apart and clean underneath it and stuff like that. This is easier to kind of clean around, spray around. I never really have to take it out and kind of wash around to get the whole bottom cleaned out, that kind of thing. And so it really doesn't matter which version that you have. It's really just allowing those grains to set up around that screen and uh, and then um, clear out your beer as it's kind of going through the, the ball valve here on the bottom. And so um, I do what we call like a batch sparge process. And so I will fill up, I'll do my normal mash in here I'll, I'll recirculate, which we're gonna go through that recirculation tool next. And then I have my, um, and then I have my uh, 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 batch sparge process where I heat up 180 degree water, throw it in here after the fact, and I have that uh, going, um, so it heats up the grains to 170 degrees, and then I let that sit for 10 minutes and I get my full boil after I boil off that second time and, uh, and go that route. So for people who have a, you know, all in one system, you know, you're really kind of, or a Bruna bag system, you're basically doing the same type of thing, but you're having to have all of that volume and your grains volume in the same container. And so, or you would have to add water after the fact. And so in those cases, you have to have a pot that's much bigger. I don't, I have a 10 gallon kettle. I couldn't do a brew in a bag with a large uh, brew because I would need something that's either 15 or 20 gallons sometimes to do the size of of uh, brews that I do. So I've, uh, that's why I do the batch sparge process because it's kind of two rounds of, of hot water going in here. But uh, any questions we have at, uh, about this thing as we, about building the mash down? I know we've had a couple of people ask specifically about this when I brought uh, brought that up. But again, I have a, how to build this thing and, and how I, and where to buy all that stuff uh, in the video description below. You can watch that video. You can also, um, uh, check out the Amazon store where I have all this stuff kind of linked in there as well.
Hey, howdy, Beer Nation. How's it going? What are we drinking tonight? So that's the mash tun. Um, I'm going to have a quick sip of my beer, and then I'll go through the recirculation tool, which I use in conjunction with this one, really. So in the... Uh, in an all-in-one system, a lot of times they'll have like a like a pump that recirculates the grains through, so it kind of uh, you know rinses the grain as it's recirculating. In my case, I didn't have a way to do that other than vorloffing. And so most people, what they'll do is they'll take something like this, they'll take their mash tun, they'll open up the the ball valve a little bit, they'll take a pitcher and they'll fill it up a little bit, and then they'll slowly pour back over their grain so they're not really disrupting the bed a lot. But what I figured is that takes forever. I, I was shutting off the valve, slowly pouring that stuff back in, took a long time, fill back up, do it again, that kind of thing. And so I was sick of waiting for the, you know, to sit there and pour, it took forever. And so I kind of thought, you know what, maybe there's this like way to just kind of re, like recirculate it and let it kind of trickle in by itself after I get done kind of filling up the pitcher. So I have a video on how to do what I call a recirculation tool, and it's literally, it's the easiest thing ever. It's literally two plastic pitchers. And so I have one that I didn't do anything with. It's literally just a plastic pitcher, and it still is a plastic pitcher. The other one is literally a, another one, and again, I would suggest getting like the, the uh, kind of flexible ones here, because the harder ones will crack if you try to drill in them and stuff. But I basically drilled in a hole to the bottom, used some uh, PVC, this is all food grade stuff, Use some PVC uh, thing. I use a, a, a little hose that gets down here and then a little screen that's meant for like a kitchen sink and that kind of thing. Uh, and then some stainless steel washers and that kind of thing to uh, where the beer would come in here, trickle out slowly through this hose and then kind of disperse so it doesn't disrupt the grain bed in here. And so what I do to, to use this is I have two kind of wooden planks. I set them on the top here and I put my DIY uh, recirculation bucket, if you want to call that tool, uh, on these two uh, boards, and they basically hold it upright. And then I go and I do my normal filling with this one uh, from the from the uh, ball valve. I slowly fill that up, get it, I fill it up all the way. I bring the hose up so it's over the water line, and I can quickly just pour all of the uh, wort into this container, and then it slowly trickles down and then uh, goes and hits that little screen and splashes in there so I can go back and start refilling again. And so it's very, very quick. If you watched any of my videos recently doing Rude, you probably see this thing in action, but this is probably one of the coolest things that I've made personally, saves me a crap ton of time during brew days and is like the cheapest thing I've made. It's probably like 15 bucks maybe for the whole thing. Um, and it saves me a ton of time on brew day. So all I have to do afterwards is just spray it out of the hose and clean it out. And I don't really have to like do too much because the next time I do this, again, all this stuff from this point out goes into my boil kettle anyway, and I'm boiling it afterwards. So I'm really just spraying this stuff out to clean it uh, right after I use it, and uh, it's good to go. So you, uh, Chris asked, do you batch sparge in two parts or all in one? And so, the, yeah, the batch sparge process is two parts, right? So. You can do a all-in-one system is like a brew in a bag, or you'll have a, um, you have half the you have a strike water in my in my case doing a batch sparge. You have two things: you have strike water, and then you have batch uh, or your sparge water. And so your strike water is the amount that you would use to soak your grains initially for that full 60 minutes. That is uh, my strike water. Then I have a separate amount, which is usually pretty close. They're usually you know right around like four and a half, five gallons each, depending on how much grain I have. Um, and there's a, there's a way to figure that out on, on a, you know, mash sparge infusion calculator. I use one on Brugger.com, which is uh, B-R-E-W-G-R.com, Brugger. I use that one. That's probably the most reliable one I found uh, for mash sparge uh, calculator. And so it, I, talk, I tell them I'm doing a batch sparge. I tell them that I'm doing my, uh, um, how much grains I have, what the grain temperature is, what um, what I'm trying to hit for a 60 minute boil, what, what I'm trying to put in my fermenter, five and a half gallons in this case, and then it spits out all the numbers that I need. So it tells me how, how warm I need my strike water, how, uh, how much water I'll need for my strike water, and then how much water I'll need for my sparge water, and then what eventually, after everything gets done, how much I should have for my boil volume at the end. So it spits out all those numbers. It's really, really nice. And so 
that is a super time saver. Um, so yeah, I have to do it in two processes, but it does help with efficiency a little bit because in a brew in a bag method, you're really expect unless you're like recirculating a lot with an all-in-one system, once you pull that out, you're, you're really just letting the, the, you're not really rinsing the grains all that much, you're just letting them drain out. And, and at a homebrew scale, it's not that big of a deal. But at a brewery scale, that's why they do the lottering and that kind of stuff. And so in this case, uh, the back sparge is kind of, uh, you know, a quicker version of that lottering process. Oh yeah, so you do your same, you probably do the same type of thing that I do, Chris. So, um, so yeah, that's the, uh, that's the DIY mash tun. That's the recirculation tool. Uh, if you have questions on that, again, I've, I've, uh, did a video on how to make both of those are in the video description. Um, let me, uh, put these things down. Let me know what you guys are drinking. Um, and if you have any other questions real quick, we'll take a five second breather and then we'll go into, um, you know, what else? We got so I have a hop spider which I'll probably do next. Um, that is the thing I probably use the most, and that's a real time saver for me um, when it comes to um, when I add a lot of hops, especially if I'm doing like a hazy IPA or something like that, because the um, the hop spider can take a lot of hops. Where some of like the built-in screen hop spiders, which I'll show you, I have both um, really get clogged up with water too. So that spar is way to go. What everybody do over the weekend? Anything cool I'm gonna be jealous about that uh, I wish I did today, but I didn't. I just sat around and did some housework and watched my game and got disappointed yet again for the third week in a row. Anybody brewing that's just jumped on? For those who are new, again, um, do, and we're going through some kind of DIY equipment. We're just asking normal questions as we go. Uh, drinking a smash beer that I brewed up with two row and cascade uh, for a competition For 10 gallon you go with seven gallon strike and three gallon sparge and have a pump for recirculation of the match Yeah, so as much as you can get in the first runnings you can I, I generally like to go um, a little well it depends on how much how much uh, grains that I have so uh, but a lot of times I, there's a specific uh, measurement they either do like it's it's like 1.33 which stands for 1.25 to 1.33 which stands for quarts per pound of malt that you have so there's a specific little um, uh, calculation and, and and there's a reason why they don't want it to be too much but you also don't want too little where it's going to be all gummy and sticky and that kind of stuff so that, that wouldn't be good either Replace blades on your mower. Okay, I'm not jealous of that. Spent a week in Maine and tried several local beers. I am jealous of that. I do like uh, visiting different breweries when I go on vacation. That's one of my funnest, th uh, favorite things to do. Getting stickers, bringing them back for the keyser, uh, trying some, bringing some home if I can. Your cold crashing at Imperial Stout that you brewed three weeks ago. Awesome. Kevin, the, the mash thickness really doesn't, but you do you don't really want it super watery either. I think it doesn't, I think it doesn't really help when it that when you have all of the water. But then again, you're doing that with a with a uh, with, you know an all in one system anyway. So it, it probably doesn't matter all that much. Uh, the more you can put in there, the better. I the reason I like to split it even is because when I'm going to pour in that water for the for the back sparge, there's uh, it still gets all of the grains back into suspension. That's not like a pasty, you know, soup, right? So I want to make sure that there's at least enough for I can stir it around and really get it rinsed off. And so, you know, having that kind of 50-50 does that for me. But, you know, to each their own, there's more than one way to, to brew beer. And, and definitely, I don't have it all figured out, of course. But that's just how I've done it and made good beer. I have to worry about an exposed element. Okay, so you do just do the rinse of the three gallons. Yeah, because... Again, yeah, if you're just using like a Rubbermaid, it doesn't. You don't need the the heat element. But if you have one, um, then then yeah, you're always you're you're heating it up all the time, so you're wanting to get that heat out of the way right away. Cape Cod, nice. Watch the pets. That's good. 
from camping the weekend, crushed some light lagers. You got a peanut, mu peanut butter milk chocolate porter for many. Yum. And a lager in the last week of lagering. That sounds good, man. I'm gonna. I'm trying to debate about some fall beers that I want to do. Uh, one of them will definitely be a porter, but whether I do vanilla or toasted coconut, toasted coconut is like a way to go. But it, it also soaks up a lot of the beer, so vanilla is awesome. I did vanilla last year though, so I might try to switch it up a little bit. Um, we brewed one with toasted coconut and the PB Fit powder, which is like you know peanut butter powder. So that one was really good uh, as well. You have a res uh, recirculation system, yeah. Use all my water to recirculate through the grains. It, it could be, um, you know, when you're recirculating, it's rinsing as it's kind of going, so it's helping pull those sugars off the grain. And that's why you'll see a lot of all-in-one systems have a pump and it recirculates through the lid and it, then it sucks it back through and you're kind of doing that. But, um, you know, again, from a homebrew scale, it's really not all that big of a deal. But, you know, from a brewery scale, of course, they'll want to try and limit as much grain as they're going to need. Uh, but, yes, that's the, the idea is that getting all of that liquid out first and then rinsing it with different water and getting it will help kind of soak up some of those uh, residual grain or sugars off the grains. And it will help efficiency. I had a friend of mine that just recently started batch sparging and said his efficiency went up doing it. So... Um, you know, it does help. I just think from a homebrew level scale, as long as you know what your brew house efficiency is, then and test that a couple times, you can just put plug that efficiency number, whatever it is, 70%, 75%, whatever that ends up being in your calculators. Then, you know, I, I just need to buy a little bit more grain, uh, to make up for the fact that your efficiency may be low. So I would just kind of test the next couple batches that you do. Make sure you do a pre boil gravity. Uh, or at least enough to get like a, a you know a hydrometer reading or a refractometer reading, and then uh, and then you go you you can test at the end like what your you know based on all the grains that you have what your efficiency is, and so um, if you have several uh, that you've done and you have those measurements you can kind of guesstimate that my brew house efficiency overall would be you know 72 percent average or something like that. I generally hit about 75, sometimes higher for my system. And it also depends on malt crush too, the grain crush. Have you ever used a nitro system? Looking forward to doing a Guinness clone. No, I do not have nitro. I I, I don't know that I'm ever going to get it to. I have four taps that I have, uh, but I do have friends that have nitro, uh, and that is a game changer for something like a darker beer like Guinness. That's awesome. You know, I don't... It, all of the systems are a little bit different. Uh, you have does it still efficiency difference between Rubbermaid and all in one. It it really doesn't. Uh, even the all in one systems are going to differ. Do you have a pump in the all in one system? Some don't, right? Some are just a literally a basket inside. Some of them don't actually recirculate. Some of them you have to buy those pumps or recirculation equipment separately. So um, it's kind of hard to tell. Plus, like some of them are a lot different. Some of them spray. Some of them have a, a little hose that comes up and just kind of dumps in the top and does that funnel through the grains a little easier. Um, and so I think even all one systems have, you know, some of them will do better than others as far as efficiency is concerned. Yeah, right. It's, it might be, uh, efficiency might be variable. Uh, I use the same process every time. I mean, every time I brew a beer, it's on the same, same system, but, but, uh, but you're right as far as if you crack your own grains, that's probably a, a good question because if you're getting your grains sent to you cracked or you're getting them cracked at the brew store, they could be different as far as, you know, who cracked them and how fine it is and that kind of stuff. And so efficiency, I, I crack all my grains with my own mill. I have my own mill, my own you know, setup. So my efficiency is pretty close most of the time. On, uh, so with with my batch sparge process, my brew day is generally about three and a half hours, maybe four hours. It depends. Um, I'm I mean by the time we I'm at, when, if I have everything actually set up and I'm just getting water, milling grains, doing stuff. What throws me and I'm, why I'm questioning a little bit is because I'm filming a lot of times while I'm doing it too. So I'm making YouTube videos and that kind of stuff. So I'll be setting up different stuff and that kind of thing. But I'll, I'm generally uh, pretty good about doing that while, I'm, while other stuff's happening. So, but generally three and a half, four hours. Um, 
And that's because, you know, there's time to heat up the water before you even get to the mash. There's, and I usually, while my water's heating up, I'm usually cracking grains uh, and milling my grains up. Um, and then there's time while your mash done sitting, of course, that's an hour. And then you have, you know, by the time you recirculate, you put another 10 minutes on there for batch barge, recirculate again, that's another half an hour. You get an hour boil, then there's cool down time, clean up time, and it's easily four hours. Yeah, so um, Victoria, I'm glad you mentioned that. I don't know if you missed when we brought it up, but I actually just pulled that open. So here's what I would do if I were you. I have a 12 inch screen in mine, but it also didn't fit, but I had to just basically bend it. So it looks like that. And that's okay, you can do that. Um, the screen is gonna work the same, whether it's right there or whether it's uh, bent a little bit. It just still gives that full um, volume of, of uh, um, screen to kind of sit against. And so you can buy the six inch, which is just fine because I used that for a long time. But when I upgraded to the 12, it also didn't. But because I, because I just kind of bent it a little bit at the end, it works just fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate at doing that at all. Yeah, and again, and that's why we kind of use an average when I talk about brew house efficiency because, you know, one one day you're going to have, you know, really good numbers. Other days you may not, but over time you'll probably have an average that you can use at least for putting together your your, your recipes. Yeah, I, I think that's probably right, Chris. Five hours with cleanups, not a bad deal. I mean, it's brewing is work. It's cleaning, sanitizing. It's a lot a lot of different stuff. I try to like, I try to do a lot of stuff while my, you know, while I'm boiling and mashing and that kind of stuff to kind of help. I kind of clean as I go too. So as I'm done with, I'm doing my boil, I'm already cleaning my mash tun out, getting all that stuff done. So that's just done. And so hopefully at the end when I'm done, I really have my hop spider, my, my actual kettle itself and any really transferring equipment for that. And that's it to, to clean. But, uh, and you know, my chiller and that kind of stuff. But other than that, the rest of the stuff that I've used all day, um, hopefully is done. So I try to like, clean as I go. All right, so next, we'll actually just talk about a hot spider. So I'm going to grab my other one that I have. I have two versions. I have a metal screen one, and I have the DIY one. And I like my DIY one better, and I'll tell you why. One sec. Let me grab a, a beer and also uh, those different hot spiders. Uh, let me know what you guys are drinking. Let me know what you're, uh, um, what you have, and we'll go from there. Yeah, that's one thing. What, and, and knowing your two different systems, Chris, is, is important because, you know, you could brew one on your, your batch sparge system and it's, um, you know, it's one efficiency. And if you know you're going to brew something on a different one, it's a different efficiency. And so if you, you know you're going to do that, you might as well just get a certain, you know, extra little bit of grain of each, you know, grains, that kind of stuff to kind of make up for what it is. And so that should help you you know, depending on what you use. I use Brewer's Friend as an app to like put all my my uh, um, items into. And so if you have something like that, it should help kind of uh, uh, when you put in your efficiency numbers, whether that's, you know, 70% or 75% or whatever it is, it should change your, your numbers a little bit as far as your malts are concerned. So it should help you uh, in that respect. And so you can kind of make um, your recipes based on what you think you're gonna be using which, which system you're going to be using it on. So without further ado, this is uh, one of the hop spiders that I have that I use generally when I only have three or less ounces of hops. And although it's a six inch opening here and it's pretty wide and this thing sits, you know, on the top, on the side of the, uh, the kettle here and it works pretty well, it's pretty fine. Um, this one, they use, they say it's 400 micron. I don't know if this is actually 400. It, I bought on Amazon, but again, 
it works really well for only a couple of ounces of pellets. And so when it, when it has more, it tends to stick to the sides. Um, when you lift it, I try to lift it up and down as much as I can to like get it off the sides and the bottom, but it does, it does clog up a little bit. And so if I had a bigger mesh though, I'd be worried that I, I'm letting more of the hot particles kind of get into the wart. And so that's not great either, but in a pinch, I use this one, but I like having both because I do like using this when I only do a couple of, of, of uh, ounces. Now, with that said, I would never do like a hazy IPA in this where I'm doing a, you know, nine ounces of hops or something like that. Yeah, so you're recirculating the whole time and stirring often so you're not getting stuck matches that mashes, that's that's right. And so for the DIY uh, hop spider, let me show you what I mean. So that's an option of getting one of those screen ones. But what I would do is for bigger boils is I made what, something like this, okay? So it's basically a, a flange that you would buy that's PVC and then it has uh, some longer bolts, carriage bolts, and then some uh, bolts on either side to kind of hold it in place and squeeze this thing into place. I bought the carriage bolts because they have the larger heads on them. So when this sits on my kettle, it like slides and hits the kettle and it doesn't let it like slide off at all. You can also buy these in metal. As you notice, I've been using this one for a year, like years, and, it's, and these bolts have kind of bent up a little bit because this plastic will warp a little bit as you, you know, it's sitting over boiling water, right? But this, should, it, I've been using this for years and years now, and I haven't had this thing, like, ever. It's not, it's not, it's not about to fall apart or anything like that, right? So with this, you also have a bigger hose clamp that'll fit over the top, and the reason is you'll use a large paint strainer bag like this one, and I buy them from Amazon because you can buy them in like 25 packs for like really, really cheap. If you go to your like home you know, Home Depot, Home Lowe's, Home, you know, supply store, these things are gonna cost like five bucks for like two of them. And it's, it's very inexpensive. So what you do with these is they have a little elastic opening on the one side. You take that elastic side, you put it up through, through the bottom, and then you wrap it over the top of this. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your, your hose clamp and put it over the top of that. And you don't necessarily need to, if it's tight, you don't need to really tighten it down with a, with a screwdriver. I just make sure mine's really snug, like it's hard to get on like that. And then this thing, what you're gonna do is when you're boiling, you're gonna set this thing on your kettle so it'll sit on all sides of the kettle, right? And, uh, and then you'll pour your hops into here and it'll sit in the bag. This has a lot more surface area and the nylon lets the, the, um, the, vol or the, the water and the wart go right through it. I mean, it, it's, it's really easy. I do take my uh, hot pad though, and I lift it up every once in a while, and I'll push the bottom of the bag up, and it lets the the um, liquid out of the bag, but it helps get those oils out and that kind of thing. But I could do like a dozen ounces of hops. I could do 12, 15 ounces of hops in this thing, and there'll be a ton. And then at the end of the day, once you pull this thing, you know you can flip it inside out, spray it out, and you can actually reuse these. I probably would use it again in the boil. I wouldn't use it, you know, if you're going to do, and I, I do this often. I use a new one if I'm gonna use it in fermentation or after fermentation, so I'm not using something that's already been used or dirty, but these things are nylon. They don't, they don't melt, they don't, uh, um, they don't wreck very easy, and you can clean them very, very well. After you've got done and it seems like it's super dirty, you go and you clean this thing, and it's uh, like spotless brand new again. So you don't really have to worry about that at all. Um, but uh, this is one of the coolest things uh, that you can do relatively cheap. Again, this is probably, I don't know, five or eight bucks worth of parts, and then you know buying the paint straighter bags on top of that. Again, I have all the stuff that I actually use in the video description under the DIY Hop Spider and on my Amazon store, which is in the links, so. Next up, Juicy Bits New England IPA, awesome. Well, looks, well the works brewery just north of me, best you ever had. I've heard of Juicy Bits, I think. I don't know if I've had it, but I've heard of it. So that's a, I like a good hazy IPA and I will not be afraid to admit that. I, I make a lot of them. I, uh, I was kind of worried about making a hazy IPA a few years ago. I just never made one even though I liked them. I thought it would be a little bit more work and harder to do because it's like, well, you're adding all this stuff and I can't, you know, you're talking about whirlpooling and a, 
I don't really have anything to really whirlpool and like recirculate and that kind of stuff. So what I do uh, for, for New England IPAs a lot is I still use these. And what I'll do for the whirlpool hops is I'll let them, I'll basically do like a hop stand for, for uh, at 170 degrees or 180 degrees. I'll put all my hops in and just kind of stir it up, let it sit in my kettle as it's kind of cooling down. I just shut off the chiller, pull the chiller out, let it sit at 170 degrees, add all the hops. Uh, and then I still put them in this hop spider. And so that's the whirlpool portion of it. And then, you know, of course, the adding at high crowds in them, when do you do that and that kind of stuff. So if you're, if you're concerned at all or worried about making a New England, don't watch a couple of my videos. I have one from the beginning of the summer, uh, which was uh, an award-winning hazy IPA. I got second place in a competition that we had uh, uh, that I entered that into, and it was amazing. One of the better hazy IPAs I've done, I did a... I use Verdant yeast from Lullamond, and that one uh, is a is actually a dry yeast, which I haven't used for a hazy IPA before, and it turned out really, really well. So try that one. Should you use a hop spider for cryo hops or direct pitch them into the wort? It's the same thing. So, so uh, to answer your question, your cryo hops are essentially regular hops, but they have. Um, less vegetal matter with them right so they have um they, they have just basically double the oils they they've taken out some of the vegetal matters they've repacked them and so it's kind of the same thing it's, it's almost like using like an ounce when you're only supposed to use half an ounce of cry when you use half an ounce of cryo it's like using a whole ounce of other hops it just has less vegetal matter uh, hop matter in it it's just got double the amount of oils and so um i would use them the exact same way i would put them both in a hop spider um, I put all my hops in the hop spider. Uh, I even do it in the dry hopping phase. Um, I will put them in smaller versions, the one gallon paint strainer bags. I tie them shut. I put them actually, a lot of times for hazies, I'll put them in magnets. I have these uh, little um, sous vide magnets. And you can see those again in my Amazon store. I don't have them right here, I'd show you. They're like little blue magnets. And I, I actually uh, magnet them up on the top of my fermenter. And then when, it, when it's at high krausen, like 24 hours after it's in, I pull those magnets and the magnets pull the hops down into the wort and it's ready to go. And then I can just pull that bag uh, before I transfer to a keg or after, either way. And it's distributing outside of Colorado. Looking forward to trying yours out. Do it, I like it. I like the DIY, DIY hop spider, plan on making it. I'm brewing a fresh hop pale ale and the bag would be nice. Yeah, you know what, the bag is super nice. So a lot, of, it's, it's similar to like using a, a brew in a bag because you're, you know, it's basically kind of a, s a smaller version of a brew in a bag, but I just use them for hops. And so the, uh, um, it, works, it works amazing. I might eventually switch out that uh, plastic one for a metal version of that metal flange. You can still get those at like a, DIY store, or not DIY, like a home improvement store, or Lowe's, Home Depot, that kind of thing. Um, so I might switch that eventually, but you know, right now it's, it's still going strong after a couple of years. But it, the only thing that I would do if I bought a new one is I would buy a smidge bigger flange just because sometimes I use whole cone hops, which I have some right here. So we use whole cone hops like these. Awesome Citra, whole, whole leaf hops. They are way bigger, right? So there's probably only, like, this whole thing was, like, I don't remember how much, a pound, right? If you buy a pound of hops and they're, like, vacuum sealed, they're, like, this big, right? They're, like, not very big. This this bag was, like, this tall. It was, like, a huge bag for a pound. So it's because they're so much bigger, putting them in that hop spider was a lot harder to, like, get them all in there. And I brewed a couple of videos, and you'd see that, but these things smell awesome. Even though they're vacuum sealed a little bit, I can kind of smell them. Um, they're, uh... These things are amazing. But uh, I've only brewed with whole cone hops a few times, but I got a few pounds of these gifted to me from a friend. And man, it's kind of fun to brew with whole cone hops. I do have some friends that actually grow their own too. So it'd be kind of fun to like use some that you grew yourself. Anyone experimented with growing their own hops? That'd be kind of cool to do. Hey, good night, Chris. Thanks for hopping on. Appreciate it. Let me know if you have any other questions and stuff uh, in the future. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's a big deal for the hop spider. 
Um, next, I'll talk a little bit about, since we're kind of, since we have a lot of questions about hazy IPAs, one of the things that hazy IPAs is uh, really kind of susceptible to is oxidation, and I think probably people probably know a lot of that, but um, it is one of the more uh, styles that is like highly susceptible to oxidation. And so when I was brewing them, that was one of the reasons why I kind of shied away from them a few years ago, and then I started doing them, and now I think I've kind of perfected it. But um, if in one of the things to, that I would be worried about was was cold crashing and transferring it all uh, and limiting oxygen exposure. And so uh, I did two things to kind of help combat that. Yeah, I did ask if, I, if you grew your own hops. If you do, that's awesome. Let us know. And so the, uh, uh, the oxidation part of it, um, I was really, really concerned about. So I did a, I bought a, a, a piece of equipment, which I'll show in a minute, called a Cold Crash Guardian, which is kind of helping prevent any suck back when you're cold crashing your uh, hazy IPA. And then I also, um, I also um, started using um, ascorbic acid. And that in the mash, you do four grams of that for like things like hazy IPAs, regular American IPAs, pale ales, that kind of thing that would be um, prone to getting oxidation during transfers and that kind of thing. And so that has really helped. Uh, that vitamin, it's basically vitamin C, and it helps scrub out you know, chemically anything in the any any anything in the beer that's going to react, that's going to uh, get oxidation, right? So in this case, uh, using those two things really really did help a lot. Um, so let's let's kind of jump in a little bit to the cold crash garden, and then I have uh, the kegging carboy cleaner yet, and the um, DIY. Uh, jockey box so you can serve beers at like different events and that kind of stuff but what's everybody drinking uh, i'm gonna get another one while it's getting hotter in my garage i might have to turn on that air conditioner let me actually turn that on see if it's too hot or too uh too loud let me know if you, this is too disturbing in the background but i'm gonna try to turn this thing on can you guys kind of hear that thing in the background is it like noisy or not at all. Hopefully the microphone's kind of canceling it out, but it's getting warm in here, so I'm turning on that air conditioner. It kind of has a hum in the background, but uh, let me know if it's annoying, and I'll shut it back off. So you have hops growing, or you've been growing hops better with uh, your last house. That's awesome. I have a lot of friends that have done that. I, you know, I haven't, uh, I would like to get a variety of them. I've heard that they grow like wild if you let them get out of control because they kind of take over. But, uh, but I'd like to do that in a, in a little area if we can. Kevin, you have a Cascade hot plant growing about four years. Hasn't done super well. Oh, good. That's awesome. Get a, Getting some fresh cone hops just to use them even a couple of times is like really fun. I like doing it. It's a, you know, pellet. I can see why they do pellets because it's just easier. They chop them up, they can compact them, and it's just less, you know, storage space. Um, and they last a lot longer when they can vacuum seal them like that. Uh, but whole, whole hops are awesome. Brewing bad, welcome. Drink, uh, drink it on your, your peach wheat ale. Awesome. That sounds good. Did you use real peaches in the secondary, or how'd you do that? Uh, I'm gonna get a refill real quick here. I'm drinking a smash beer, that's pretty good. Went down with a little bit. Come in, I thought I got something in my eye. But anyway, so if I'm rubbing my face, that's probably why. Uh, drink a peach weed ale. I'm gonna fill up here. If you guys have questions, leave them in there. I have uh, a few DIY things that I went over for those who are new that might be have just joined us. I went through uh, my mash tun, uh, recirculation tool, my hop spiders. Uh, I'm gonna do a cold crash guardian next. I'm gonna talk about that and why I bought that for hazy IPA specifically. I have a jockey box and my keg and carboy cleaner after that. So um, we got a few other things left to go and a few things we've already done, but. Feel free to uh, put any questions, comments uh, in the video description. Let me know what you guys are drinking, and I'm going to get a refill.
You're just talking about uh, hops, growing whole hops yourself, and I would love to do that. This is that smash two row cascade. I've put it a little center, but that's okay. Letting out those aromatics. Mm. I like cascade hops a lot too. You have 11 varieties. Awesome. That's sweet. I need to, I need to do that. I couldn't even keep a garden alive last year because I was brewing too much and not watching my vegetables. Um, but let me, uh, let me get right into the, uh, uh, cold crash guardian. So for the cold crash guardian, um, it looks like this. It's basically got a, a bag that fills with CO2 and this is during uh, when you hook it up to fermentation and it's got two other hoses that go through and I'll kind of talk a little bit about it. So basically when you get this thing, the bag is like flat. I left, I left a little CO2 in here, but what you do is uh, when you're brewing a beer and you hook it up and it's already fermenting, it's, it's, it's kicking out through your airlock, it's kicking out CO2, okay? And so the idea is that you're gonna capture some of that CO2 from the um, beer uh, uh, fermenting rather than having to fill this bag up with you know, CO2 from like a tank. You're just gonna get that, the stuff that would have normally been uh, going through the fermenter. One thing you want to make sure is that it's kind of towards the end because you don't want like to have to get a blow off and then end up having you know all that blow off material getting into this bag. But um, but if you're if you're for sure you're not going to get a blow off uh, or you're not going to need a blow off tube and you're uh, this can this fills up pretty quick so you can basically do it in the last couple of days but you can hook it up right away if you needed to. Let me show you why. So this small end here goes to your fermenter. So. It can go in your airlock, go in a bung, it can go however you're gonna connect it. I usually put this this thing right inside of a rubber bung and I put that in the top of my big mouth bubbler or you know, for monster, whatever I got, right? And so uh, there's a little valve on this thing and there's a open uh, that leads to the, the larger bladder here and then there's a little uh, valve in the front and there's a close. So what I would do is I would leave this thing open and it allows the beer then or the, the CO2 when it's hooked to your fermenter, inside your fermenter here, it's coming up from your fermenter, it travels in this thing, and it fills up the bag full with CO2. With the bags full, or beforehand, what I do is sometimes I keep this closed, and I let the CO2 purge the, the, the hoses first. On this side, after the little T, there's what we call a, a one-way check valve. So I got this little valve in here, and it comes past this little T, goes through the check valve, and then it can push beer er, out. So what's gonna let it do is it's gonna let it build pressure up in this bag. Once the bag is full, then the, there's enough pressure to push through the check valve. Or if this thing, if this uh, nozzle's closed, it's gonna let there, there's gonna be enough pressure to just let it go through and push through the check valve. And then this goes into like a little can of sanitizer or something, right? A little jar or whatever, of sanitizer. And so, um, You'll see the fermentation action because it's going to be bubbling through the sanitizer, and you won't have a but you won't have a, an airlock on the top. Instead, it'll go into here. It'll fill up this bag, and then it'll push the excess out here, out of this. Now, once this bag gets full or even partially full, it doesn't have to be completely plumb full like this one. This is more than enough CO2 that you're not going to get sucked back. And they make two different sizes. Excuse me. Of this, I would recommend getting the smaller size. Um, you can either buy this, which is a cold crash guardian, or you can make your own. And I did a DIY version of this on my page. And again, all that stuff is in the link description below this. But basically, this thing's going to allow this thing to fill up a CO2. And then when you're done and you're ready to cold crash, this won't this check valve won't let anything suck back through it. So you're not going to get sanitizer when it's sitting in here back through the hose. It can't do that. It's a one-way valve only. So the only way to get the pressure when the, when the beer cools down and it kind of creates a vacuum in your carboy, the only way to really get, CO, or get pressure to release is by taking it from the bag. And that's just CO2 that the beer's already released. And so basically it's just gonna suck back through and go in your fermenter and not have a, a vacuum created. It's just gonna take from this bag of CO2. And so I have a DIY version of this again. I have this uh, video where I kind of show how this works in the video description where it's actually hooked up to uh, uh, an actual uh, fermenting 
here, and I, you can kind of see that in action. And so that's a really cool um, uh, piece of equipment. Again, I bought that one. It's called, again, called Cold Crash Guardian, and that link is in the video description, and, and there's one to that website right there too. But that is an awesome piece of equipment. I, I had a lot of people who said they couldn't get it shipped overseas. And so because of that, I said, well, you know what? Maybe there's a way we can just DIY make one. So I have both of those videos in there uh, below just so you guys can check those out. That's an easy way for you guys to kind of prevent oxidation when you're doing cold crashing and kind of worry about things getting sucked back in there. Um, so then, you had, you, know, you had a peach puree in the secondary. Awesome, that's good. Yum. Uh, I love adding fruit to a beer. So, I mean, depends on what it is, but yes, uh, that's, a, that's a good one. So then uh, that, that's why I added the, uh, the Cold Crash Garden is because of that. And so, um, hold on, I gotta, I gotta shut some off real quick. Sorry, I had a light over there and then shut off. Anyway, so the, uh, so when you, uh, when you have the Cold Crash Garden, you don't have to worry about the suck bath. And then when you, when you take that off, um, most of the stuff will be full of CO2 and you don't have to worry about that there's oxygen been sucked back in there. But using that uh, ascorbic acid will also help as well. So um, that's always a good thing to do. <laughs> Adam asks, where are all my shiny fermenters? Well, I don't have shiny fermenters because I do a lot of DIY stuff, as you can imagine. But I brew good beer because all of these here on the shelf are proof. So I've got, I've got more ribbons. I just don't have enough room on my thing. Some of them are doubled up on there. And then, uh, but yeah, so Robert made containers brew good beer. Adam should know, he's tried some of mine. He knows. Uh, question, I'm doing an extract sour with Philly sour. When should I go into secondary with fruit? Started at uh, 1046, now at 1015, We're looking at final gravity being 1007. So uh, Philly sour is one, I haven't used Philly sour, but I'm very familiar with it. I've tried a bunch of beers with Philly sour. So it's a good one to do in a pinch. If you haven't done like a two-day kettle sour process, or you don't you don't have time to do it or whatever, um, so that's good in a pinch. The uh, when you're going into the secondary with fruit, wait until the primary is completely done. I um, mean, you're pretty close. You know, being at 10:15, anything under 10:12, 10:10 should be done. But your final gravity, uh, wait until it's completely done. So don't don't rush going into a secondary. You want your beater to actually be done fermenting. And so if you're going to get to, if you're expecting your final gravity to be 1007, then let it, then let it get down there, or at least be done. So what I wait is I let it sit until it's been at the same final gravity for about two or three days. Then I let it sit, uh, um, or then I will transfer it to a secondary with the fruit already in the secondary, sanitized, mashed up, however you need to do it. And we went through that with the blackberry sour a couple of weeks ago, uh, or check out my other sour videos on how I add fruit to the secondary. But I put them in one of those paint strainer bags like I had for this hop spider. I tie those closed, I put it right in the fermenter, and then I rack my beer on top of it. And you will have a little bit of fermentation action go on in the secondary because there should be a little bit of residual yeast, but not much. Even though you'll see some airlock action, a little bit of uh, crowds and starting, I mean, I mean, tiny, tiny little bit, it's not enough to re-ferment all that sugar that's going to be in the fruits, so don't worry about that. Um, you're still going to be sour, you're still going to have the fruits in there, that's one, one thing. Um, uh, Brick, the next thing to do is if you haven't done a, a true kettle sour, do a cr true kettle sour. I like Philly sour. Here's my two, two critiques. Um, if you want to get it very, I, I wouldn't say very sour, if you want to get it more sour, it's hard to do that with Philly sour. It only gets so tart, right? And I don't like a real, real warhead sour beer anyway, but I also feel like the Philly sour has like kind of a green apple flavor to it. And I can almost always pick that out. Um, maybe I'm just more susceptible to that than others. And I have had some that really work well. So if you're doing a fruit that works well with that flavor, awesome. You can also uh, add a little bit of more lactic acid to drop it a little, the pH a little bit more ahead of time to get it to be a little bit more sour. But in my opinion, I prefer a true kettle sour over Philly sour. But I do, I have had really good beers on Philly sour that were, you know, tart and sweet and with the fruits. And so it worked out great. So. I would do it in a pinch. I, if I had the time, I would do a kettle sour. So uh, try both and see which one you like better because it's just my opinion and I'm just me, right? So 
Um, so that was the Cold Crash Guardian. Again, we talked about that one a little bit. Uh, what should I do next? Should I do the jockey box or should I do my keg and carboy cleaner? And what's everybody drinking? I need to switch it over to have an ESB and then I have my uh, maple pecan brown ale, which uh, turned out pretty well. Adam knows he helped me brew that one. Adam from Cheeseology, that you see the Cheeseology name there, he's in my Sticky Nuts uh, Maple Pecan Brown Ale video. The Jockey Box. Yeah, no, nothing wrong with doing that, Brick. I'm just saying, if you if you try try both and see if that see if one works, but that's a good way to go to see if you like them and uh, and then go the second route. Uh, kettle sours are super easy, and I've got a million videos on how to do it. So ask questions for real. I don't mind answering questions. Goza Lemon Kettle Sour is the next weekend brew day for me. First sour. Awesome. Lemon. Uh, what, how are you adding the lemon? Are you adding lemon zest? Or how are you, when are you adding it? Are you doing lemon zest in the boil? Or are you doing something in the secondary? I, I, I do like a sour. I, uh, I I think I've said this before. My wife is not a big beer drinker, so. Sipping on sticky nuts. Yep, that's right. That's why we named it maple syrup over some roasted pecans. That's all you're going to get is sticky nuts all day long. I don't know if you guys picked that out in the video. I did a, uh, I said the, because the nuts uh, can have oils and stuff on them, so I said, you know, you always want to make sure you, you get the pat the nuts dry because you're not going to get good head with sticky or with uh, oily nuts. Rule of thumb: no good head with oily nuts. Zest in the boil, awesome. You know, I I, I love using lemon zest and orange zest, tangerine zest. I did a uh, tangerine IPA, which I took a really good IPA recipe that I had, and I just made it, and I added um, tangerine peel to it and zested it. And, or I, well, I really just kind of cut up, made sure I had most of the pith out, scraped all the pith and stuff out of it. I didn't really actually zest all of it. But, man, I tell you, that was fantastic. Um, adding any, ta like, tangerine zest, making a little tincture or put it in the boil, best way to go man I, adding a little citrusy to uh, what what is otherwise a great like pale ale or ipa is the way to go uh but i have not done a, like a lemon sour but that would be good like a lemon drop almost huh i'd even put some i would even go as far as uh do some lemon zest in the boil and then add some actual lemons in the secondary absolutely do that like you probably wouldn't need all that much but i would probably do like I don't know. You don't want to like really squeeze them. I mean, I would mash them up a little bit or something like that. But I would add, I would add some lemons definitely in the secondary. Just let them soak it up. Get some of that good lemon flavor. You could always do that after the fact too if you like don't think you have enough flavor. Like taste it as you're like racking it. If you think you need more, throw in some lemons. Definitely. Or just lemon juice at that point. All right, so let's jump into uh, the the um, jockey box. So, what is a jockey box? For those who are wondering, um, it is a way for you to serve your beer outside of having a refrigerator. So you can take a keg out of your fridge, you can throw it in a bucket of ice, and it will go through a jockey box and it will serve cold beer for guests at an event or a wedding or in your backyard or whatever, right? And so um, we have two of them that we use uh, frequently for our for our homebrew club, and we have uh, we so we can serve eight beers at a time. And so I have one I made for my channel, and I uh, show you guys kind of how to do it at, on a super cheap homebrew scale. So you can buy some very 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 expensive ones with like stainless steel coils and all this other stuff on the inside. But I'm going to show you how I did mine very quickly um, because it's a, a time saver. 
and it, it or, I mean, it's money saver and time saver, really. Kurt, do people still use secondary fermentation? Maybe, and I, the quite short answer is yes, sometimes. And the reason I say sometimes is because I always use a secondary fermentation for uh, for things that I'm going to be adding fruits or other things that I'm going to be adding a lot of other, like, so for instance, in my kettle sours, I always transfer to a secondary because I don't want all the yeast in there when I'm adding six pounds of fruit. So I'm trying to get it off the yeast to add the fruit in the secondary. Um, I don't always do it for other beers. I will cold crash, let it condition for a week, cold crash and keg. Uh, most other beers now. I used to I used to use a secondary quite often, uh, but you don't have to. It's not necessary uh, for most beers. But I will do it when I'm adding a lot of stuff. I will do it if I'm doing a porter and I'm adding toasted coconut or even like a tincture of something. Um, I don't. I like to get it off the yeast cake in certain cases. So yes and no. And and and. Uh, just homebrew that doesn't this doesn't take any more time right and the reason I say that is because just because primary fermentation is done doesn't mean the beer is ready to drink okay it always probably needs another week to sit there in condition and to like really finish up what it's you know what it's doing and so even if you don't use a secondary you should always have it in that primary another week in my opinion just gonna say most beers like green for a little while it needs that little time to clean up and so, uh, unless you're using like a Kvike yeast or you're really rushing something to get it because you need to have it done for like an event, leave it sit. Beers get better after that second week, every time, every time. I will, I will say that I don't care if it's the freshest hazy IPA, that second week is needed after primary fermentation is done. So whether that's in a secondary or whether that's in your primary and you're just letting it condition for a week, I would always do a second week. Uh, even if secondary in a bottle, uh, yeah, I like I said, I mean, it's really about conditioning time. And so whether that's in a secondary or second week in the primary, it really doesn't matter. I have some dehydrated lemons I'm going to use that in the secondary. Well, that's, that's good too. Yeah, that'd be good. I have to get my hazy off the yeast and do a massive dry hop. Yeah, that's another reason too. So um, if you're doing a lot of stuff in the secondary, whether that's dry hopping, whether that's adding fruit, whether that's whatever, I always add to a transfer to a secondary when I'm doing, when I'm adding a bunch of stuff that I don't want to like mess with the yeast cake a whole lot, um, or want to get it off the yeast cake for those reasons. But depends on what it is. My hazy IPAs, I generally when I'm dry hopping, I do it a high krauser almost always, and I really don't add any after the fact, and then I cold crash and keg it. And that's that's specifically because hazies are I don't want to transfer it as much as I can, specifically just because it's four hazies. But but other beers I will definitely transfer it to a secondary if I need to. But but you can always purge your secondary fermenter too. So people worry about oxidation and stuff, just take a little CO2, purge the bottom of it. Even if you're not filling it all the way up, if you're filling like, you know, if you have CO2 and you're transferring to the bottom, you're not splashing around oxygen at that point, you're, it's lifting up, right? So it's, you'll have a little blanket of CO2, which is nice. Yeah, SO4 is slow. It is. It is. Uh, it is slow. So it needs a little bit extra time uh, to do its thing. I've noticed that too. And I actually uh, ferment SO4. Usually I do a lot of ale yeast at like 67 degrees. I'll do SO4 at like 64 or less, maybe 63. It likes to be a little colder to be clean. And that takes some time too, because because the colder the yeast, the more it takes time. Yeah, no, I agree, Kurt. I think I'm just saying there's there's times where it makes sense and there's times that don't. I think uh, all of it is conditioning, um, but I just like to get it off there when I'm adding different stuff. But yes, I, I think you're right in the fact that I used to use a secondary for everything, and then uh, but now I don't as much. Thanks, Jared. Have a good one, man. How do you pick up target? Uh, pick a target fermentation temp when a yeast has a large range. 
so that's a great question, Mike. Good, good, good uh, question. So say you pick up a yeast and uh, target fermentation or optimum fermentation in the back says it's like 62 to 75 degrees or something like that. Smack in the middle. Go right in the middle of that. That's where it wants to be. So most of the time that's going to be like 62 to 75, 67, right? So go right smack in the middle. And then if you err on one side, high or low, you're still way within the recommended range. And so to me, the way to go is, is uh, take that, that optimum temperature that they recommend and just right down the middle. Sometimes I'll err on the side of the lower side, um, but most of the time it's right in the middle. All right, let's get into the jockey box. We've talked enough. So now we will do that. Let me get in that thing quick. So for this one, I'm going to put it back here. So you guys can all see. So let me know if I need to turn on my mic or something because it might be a little farther away. So I'll try to speak up. So for this one, it's basically a cooler, right? It's basically just your regular cooler. I've actually installed the tap handles on purpose backwards for this one. And so um, you can have the lid that opens the other way if you want to. Uh, but essentially it has four taps. Looks very similar to my refrigerator here. But I have four taps that are, I've installed on here. So you will need some extra tap handles. But you can do this as little as like one. You don't have to have four, you can have just one a piece. But the idea is, is that in the middle of this is where the magic happens, right? So you have, let me get this over here now a little bit. So in the inside, let me flip it around. On the inside is where it cools down. On the, or well, I guess you guys can't see this here. So let me, let me put that back over here. So on the back side is where it comes from the beer. So you would have your kegs, they would be sitting in like a bucket with ice water or something like that. And then you would have your connections back here. These actually come out from the inside. And in the inside of this, I have, well, these are for the gas. So you would have a separate setup. You'd have a separate setup for your gas lines. So they would have a uh, five, uh, I have a five uh, uh, gallon CO2 tank that I hook up to this thing. And then it has a splitter here and, a, and another one that goes to four different lines for CO2. And so I just put it at, at, at serve, or pressure. Those hook up individually to the kegs. But that doesn't need to be in the cooler. This is just separate, right? So although you need that, you can watch the video if you want to see like how to build all that stuff. That's again in the link description for this jockey box. For this, on the inside here, you're going to have Basically, your, uh, your shanks that come from your tap handles, they're going to connect to some hoses in the inside, and those hoses are going to be coiled up into these little coils. That's going to help when you fill this thing with ice and then a little bit of water, that's going to help cool the beer lines down as beer is running through there. And then the lines in the back pull out, and I have them pull out like a long ways, so I can connect them for, so I can connect them to a keg that's sitting on the ground with a bucket and ice around the keg. So then this thing connects to your keg, beer flows through this line, it goes in and gets cooled down by the ice and water that's inside of this uh, cooler, and then it comes out cold when you're pouring taps on the other side. So I'll give you a little bit kind of closer up look on the inside of what's going on here, if I can. Yeah. So each one of those lines has a coil, and then I zip tied those coils closed, and each one of these in the back goes to a separate K. And then this thing, I fill this whole cooler, which I think this cooler was like 20 bucks, right? I fill this whole cooler with ice and a little bit of water, and I add the water on purpose. Let me get these lines over there. And I add the lines, uh, I add the water a little bit in the back on purpose because I want the, uh, the, the water and the liquid to fully touch those lines. Excuse me. Because it will help give a little bit more contact area to the beer. Excuse me. Yeah, I'm getting burpy. Um, but I, it gives it a little bit more contact area for the beer. 
And then uh, when it, when it, the more contact that it has with the cold water and ice in the inside of that cooler, the colder it's going to be when they pour. So you, again, remember when I said earlier that you can have a much, much, uh, you can have a much, much more expensive setup than that. They sell these type of uh, jockey boxes online, and they have like these stainless steel coils on the inside or copper or whatever, and they're like hundreds of dollars. Well, you don't need to do that. Like it's a, if it's sitting in ice water, you can just buy a smaller diameter hose, and you're only pushing, you know. 12 pounds of pressure on there so it doesn't need to be you know something like co2s you know you're not putting 50 pounds of pressure on them so you can actually buy a smaller diameter serving hose which i did for the part that's sitting on the inside and then then the parts that i pull on the outside they have a, a big a little bit thicker because i'm pulling them kind of through the hole in the back of that uh, cooler so i have two different sizes of hose but on the inside diameter is the same it's just the thickness of that uh, plastic and so when the uh, or the nylon tubing, and so or vinyl tubing. So then when it's going in there, it cools the beer down much much quicker. It doesn't need to be metal. It doesn't need to be expensive. It can just go really quickly. And when people are pouring that, it's ice cold still. And uh, and so you'll pour a beer. There's probably a beer or a pint worth. By the time you're pulling the first pint, the second pint of beer that you're that, that would be coming out of that is already getting cold from the ice water. And so as long as you're keeping ice on that and keeping ice on the keg. The keg's are already kind of cold, so the beer's not warming up all that much anyway. And then you're uh, you're just kind of keeping it cold as it's going through the, the fermentation uh, or the the uh, jockey box. So that works really really awesome. We brought that to several different events uh, that we've had over the last couple of years, and it's worked amazing. So uh, that thing is a, a champ, and uh, I'm glad I made that. It's uh, really really cool to use, uh, and we can have like six eight beers on at one time. It's cool. But any questions about that thing? Anyone made anything similar to that? Have you guys uh, have you guys used a jockey box or seen jockey boxes being used? Yeah, I, it's almost like a pun. Our cooler because they are coolers, but yeah, they are much much uh, more. Uh, they're less expensive and generally. You'll find people like in your homebrew club that like have an extra tap or something like that. And uh, the only reason we use four of them in this, and we have another four version of this that somebody else has, uh, is because uh, we have sometimes eight beers that we want to like showcase to people at different events. Uh, but if you were just doing it in your backyard for some friends and you just want to have two, you could make a smaller cooler or even the same size cooler with more line in the middle, keep it cold, um, with just two taps on it. That's totally fine very easy to do you're really just taking like basically like a hole uh, a bit for your uh, uh, drill drilling a couple holes in the front and back of a, of a cooler spend about 20 bucks on a cooler there's some other you know investment in the tap handles and the shanks that's the probably the biggest expense of those but if you can find them relatively cheap or used that's the way to go yeah the diy projects man don't buy them you'll say like well we pay i think i paid well, I had some things donated, but I think all together I might have a hundred and maybe a hundred bucks into that thing. But I got some tap handles and stuff donated to me to make that. But I but between the lines and the I bought all the new CO2 lines and and and, and post connections. But you could reuse post connections that you have in your house. So if you already have those, again, same thing. Yeah, so you have, uh, yeah, there's, Larry did one. Um, he did one on a jockey box. He actually, like, took a temperature and see how cool it would get going through there. I think he made one with copper, too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then he said, or I like the creativity. I use some bottles for portability. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously, if you're going to, if you're not going to drink a whole keg worth, you would just bottle some or something like that. But uh, but this is for bringing, like, five gallons or more uh, to a to an event, of course. Um, Kevin, what's the best way to transport the keg? Just making sure that you don't lose pressure in that thing, so don't leak it as you're, you know, don't bleed it or anything like that after you take it off the gas. Leave it fully uh, pressurized, um, and then when you get there, the first thing you do is get the thing set up and don't move it because you want to let that kind of settle down. It's like shaking up a soda can or a soda bottle or something like that. 
and just letting it sit for a little bit because if you do then you won't have a you know bomb but if you try to like serve out of it right away it's going to be a, a complete mess so make sure that you're bringing it to your vent and getting it uh settled down as quickly as you can yeah robert good question about the, the cleaning process very good question so um after you're done it's i do the same thing with cleaning the lines in my kegerator okay so when you get done using your your uh, thing uh fill up a keg if you have one or an empty one say you drank all the ones out there it'd be easy to do uh take your a keg fill it with half full with a cleaner so i use in my case i use um uh the oxyclean free and clear so and for most of the stuff or you could use pbw or whatever right so if you go uh and you fill that thing up halfway shake up your keg like you're cleaning your keg anyway then hook that thing up run cleaner through all the lines like so hook it up like a, the beer line with cleaner in it run the cleaner through all the lines and do that for each of the lines uh you know fill up several pints full of the cleaner uh from the keg and then do switch to the next line same thing next line next line make sure you leave the cleaner sit in there for about 10 15 minutes or so and then switch and do the same thing in your keg but with sanitizer so then rinse out your keg clean your keg say put sanitizer in it halfway then run all of your lines through with sanitizer and then leave the lines my lines are right now are full of sanitizer so i don't i don't want to hit any of the taps and so i was trying to be careful when i was picking it up they're full of sanitizer so the next time i go and use this thing i will run some more sanitizer and stuff through it just to make sure but right now there's sanitizer sitting in there so i'm not getting any junk and stuff i'll probably clean out the uh, the tap handles and stuff before i use it and make sure that there's nothing in there because they can get stuff inside of them but in but the lines themselves should not be nasty because i've got sanitizer sitting in them what about stirring up the sediment in the bottom that would take a while to settle back down wouldn't it yeah so um th that's a good question too so b before i would transport a keg i would pitch a little bit of you know whatever you're i would pitch the first couple pints so don't don't cold crash it and not touch it. Make sure that you're, if you're gonna pour a couple pints out, pour a, a couple out first. And normally a lot of that sediment will come out in the first couple. But yes, I mean, that, there is some risk in doing that. And the colder that keg is, the faster it will settle down. But yes, you can do that. The other option is, is if you have a keg that has a floating dip tube, that will take from the top, not the bottom. And so you can do that. And hopefully some of the sediment will have already started like trickling down and then you're serving from the top. But you have to buy a different floating dip tube attachment for your kegs in order to do that. So you can you can do that definitely. All right, I think I went through most of my stuff except for the keg and carboy cleaner, which is uh, surprisingly one of the like most popular videos on my channel because people love to clean their kegs apparently. So and make it easy. So I'll, I'll go through that in a second. I am gonna get another beer. I'm gonna put away those hoses and stuff in the jacky box quick. But that thing is. Really cool. If you haven't made one of those, it's a neat, neat, neat thing to do. And I think I'm going to go with my sticky nuts next. <clears throat> All right. What else, what's everybody drinking? Did you switch to something else? Anything good? Anything I need to know about so I can pick some up? Let me know. Let me grab some. Uh, let me grab some of the stuff out of the way, and I'll be right back. And then I just store this stuff right inside of this thing because it's the easiest way so you don't lose it. Alright. And last but not least, we got What's everybody got? I have an Aldi dry hop sour. Six ninety nine for four pints can't beat that. Is it good? 
sometimes you can figure out the Aldi beers or even uh, the other, what is that, Lidl? It's like Aldi. Sometimes you can figure out what actual brewery brews those. Um, look on the, there's a uh, address on the bottom of the labels usually. And, it, and then if you look that up, you can tell what brewery actually brewed that beer. Smash brewed for an education club meeting. Sounds like a cool meeting. I bet they have an awesome president. Two row cascade and Kvike. Another half uh, double double IPA, nice. Another half. Is that the brand? Another half, or are you only having a half? <laughs> Other half. It seems like uh, the brand. I don't know that I've heard of that. Where's that out of? Let me grab a beer while we're at it. You are all now glancing at my sticky, sticky nuts, maple pecan brown ale. Ooh. That's a good one. You can equally pick out the roasty pecans with the uh, maple syrup. Very, very good. Uh, da -da -da. A 15 pack of founders all day. I'm gonna do next. Uh, nice. Oh, it's out of Brooklyn. Nice. You're only drinking the bottom half, but you have to get to the top. It makes sense. I always drink the bottom half. Other half in Philly. Brew some solid beers. Oh, he said uh, it's in uh, Brooklyn, New York. All right, last but not least on the agenda tonight I have um, is the um, DIY keg and carboy cleaner. So the this thing was something I probably get asked about maybe the most out of everything that I've made DIY, probably because there's just more parts and stuff to it. But I, again, have all, again, all this stuff linked in the video description and underneath my um, uh I, have, I think I even have it categorized differently in my Amazon store, so check that out. But in this case, uh, this cardboard cleaner is actually pretty pretty simple. It's it, the, the main component of it at the bottom here is a sump pump, right? So in this case, it's a, a one-third horsepower submersible sump pump. And you don't need to buy that new, but you can if you want to. Um, I, I got a used one on Craigslist, I think, or something like that. And, but you can get it wherever you want to. Um, there's a relatively inexpensive one that I put on uh, my Amazon page, so you can check that out. This has a garden hose style attachment that comes out of it. And so essentially you have PVC piping, and in this case, I think these are one of these, three quarter? Yeah, three quarter inch uh, PVC piping. And then what I've done is I, I've made it come out, and then I actually made connections to my keg. So the nice thing about this is when I put this into a bucket of cleaner, so what I'll do is I'll have three buckets like these, and I'll fill them up probably, I don't know, maybe a third or a half full. One will be with cleaner. Well, like uh, some, uh, I'll use like PBW. And then I one will be with the with just plain water. And then the other one will be with sanitizer. But for the sanitizer, I use the low foam sanitizer because it's going to be spraying through this thing. You don't want to use the regular sanitizer that we probably all use. It's like the clearer looking one. You want to use like the purple version. That's the low foam one. Okay, that one is, uh, uh, that's the star sand one anyway. Star sand purple or star sand yellow or whatever the clear version is. If you use the clear version, it foams up a lot and you're not gonna be able to run it very long or else it'll spill over the bucket. If you use the low foam one, uh, you, can, you can do that one. And with the PBW, sometimes I even add, if you watch my videos and you see I use firm cap S for my boils, you can actually use that stuff in your PBW cleaner. So <laughs> sometimes I've done that in a little bit in a pinch just to keep it from foaming up. But usually PBW doesn't foam that much and it usually just foams right away and then you're done. So in this case, I have this, it's got a garden hose attachment, goes to some PVC connections. Then I have these split off for the uh, gas 
and the beer serving lines. And so that way the beer or the cleaner gets pushed through all of the dip tubes in the, in the actual K, right? Then I have this little uh, like H uh, piece that sits on the top. This is where when I put the keg upside down on top of this thing, it's gonna sit on top of this H thing. And I have this other bracket here just to help it so it doesn't tip. But that's just a piece of, that's just a uh, metal rod. And so in this case, the, the, the keg sits right on, on the top of this thing upside down. And then this hose, as I go up, and then I have this cap on the top, I have several little holes drilled on the sides in all different angles, and then I get all over the top of this cap. It's probably hard to see this in the back of it. Let's see if you can see it. Maybe? Okay, you see all those little holes I drilled on the top? Tons of little holes. That's gonna help, and they're all different angles. So when I'm drilling these, I'm kind of drilling an angle here, an angle there, an angle, you know. So they're not all straight out. But when you, when you turn this thing on, and you get a uh, keg on here, it's pretty sturdy because it's once you tighten it down and it, it doesn't really move, right? So then you put it on the bottom of that thing, you set a keg on the top and then you uh, plug in the sub pump, which is just a regular plug in. I use a, I actually use a surge strip so I can just toggle it on and off. But, uh, but you can just plug that thing in and then all of these uh, holes that you've drilled in this thing and on the top spray outwards every direction within inside the keg. And at the same time, You've got your, your cleaner going through here, going through the dip tubes in the inside of it too. So it's literally getting to all portions of your keg at one time. Now, you can also use this for carboys because you just don't connect these two. So because these are automatic shutoffs, they're not going to spray when they're not connected to anything. So the good news, seems about to fall off. Um, the good news is when these things are, when these things are not being used, you just put those things right in the bucket. And then now I can take a, a carboy, I can put it right on the top, whether that's a small necked one, or I can use one of my glass big mouth bubblers, doesn't matter, and I can set it right on the top, and it'll do the same thing, it'll spray all different directions, and it'll clean it up. And I can let that run for, you know, five, 10 minutes on one that's really, really dirty, you come back, you open up, sparkling clean on the inside. Then you run it through the, uh, after you get all the, so what I'll do generally if I have more than one keg, is I'll do all my kegs at the same time, and then I'll do, and then I'll, I'll, I'll clean them all. And then I'll take them and I'll move this whole thing. You pick it up out of the, out of the cleaner, set it in the, set it in the, the uh, uh, clean, clean water one. I rinse all of them, get all the clean water uh, rinsed through them. And then I pick it up, and I put it in the sanitizer one, and I sanitize all of them and that kind of thing. And so, uh, the good news is that I can clean five kegs. With the same water all of them in the same so i'll use all of them the dirty water and the cleaner for the you know five kegs then i go over the clean water then i go over to the sanitizer and i'm only using that little bit for each one versus filling up each one and cleaning them like that and so if I, unless i'm cleaning lines in here as well which sometimes i do then i won't fill up any of the kegs and clean them individually i'll just use this thing and this thing in a pinch after a brew day or you have a couple kegs to clean this thing is a uh, Awesome. I mean, it'll take, you can do other things while it's sitting there cleaning itself. So this thing is a no-brainer. Uh, probably one of the cooler things I bought and made. Uh, and again, it's just buying, you know, these PVC connections you can buy at any hardware store. Uh, and that connects to, like, again, the, the uh, um, garden hose attachment here. And then it's just PVC tubing. And I have, uh, on the link that I have to build this thing, I have all of the items that you will need to buy in the video description. So specifically for that one, I don't have everything in the world on my Amazon store, but I do have like some pump and some other things. But the whole list of the PVC items that you need will be in there. So if you have any questions about that, happy to go through. Let me see where we're at here. You had uh, da, 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 founders. That's good. Centennial IPA. That is good. I like Centennial Ops for sure. Thanks, Charles. We'll see you, man. Have a good one. Have you had any issues with the Lowe's Igloo cooler cracking or anything? Seems to hold temp. You good? Yeah, actually, um, yeah, the uh, mash tun, is that what you're talking about? The mash tun? Yeah, it, it holds temperature within one or two degrees at all times. Uh, the only thing I, I talked about when we first got on was I do heat up the mash tun to, uh, in the wintertime, so it doesn't, it's not really cold. 
So if you if you have it sitting out and you're brewing outside, and you have it sitting outside, I actually put a little bit of boiling water in it, or I just you know, or at least 100, you know, 80 degree water or something like that, doesn't have to be boiling. And then I put the I put like a half gallon or something like that in it, let it sit with the lid on it to like warm up the inside. And that's only what that's just doing is just taking the chill out of it. So when you put your grains and your and your uh, other uh, strike water in there, it doesn't like lower it by a couple degrees because it's taking the coolness of the of the mash tub. Other than that, it holds temp perfect. If you if you do that, then you'll see maybe one or two degrees, maybe out of 60 minutes. But most of your starch conversion happens in 15 minutes anyway. So as long as you're holding for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you're good. <coughs> that I need to do on a separate video because um, Clawhammer did that on one of their videos and it was eye-opening how fast the starch conversion actually happens during your mash. Most of us do 60 minute mashes and it's not something you need to do. Uh, most, especially if you're using a lot of light colored malts, you can do a 30 minute mash most of the time. But I usually still do it because I'm doing other things and stuff like that. And I just want to make sure I'm getting all the conversion done because I'm still like weighing hops and doing other things. And in my case, filming all everything. So I still do like a 30 minute. But a lot of times if I'm like 45 minutes in and I think I'm good, I just start more laughing and be done with it. So 60 minutes isn't always necessary. Uh, da, da, da. Thanks, man. Thing looks awesome. Yeah, it, it's actually really cool. I actually really do like that one a lot. The recirculate or the cleaner. Do you need to scrub it at all? So uh, no, because you're running cleaner through it. I mean, re in reality, the thing, when you get done using it, you're, you're using the last part of it as sanitizer, and then it actually drains out the bottom. So you're, you're running cleaner through it, which is cleaning it anyway. Then you're running w water through it, and then you're running sanitizer through it, and then, it dr and then all those tubes drain out through the bottom. So unless you're keeping liquid in there, it doesn't mold or anything like that. But also, the next time you're going to use it, you're running cleaner through it. So you could just run extra cleaner and dump it if you wanted to, if it ever got nasty. Yeah, honestly, brewing beer is all it is. is when I tell people, uh, oh, I brew beer, but most of the time it's just like cleaning and sanitizing. Like, well, we watch a pot boil from a distance while it's doing its thing in there. But uh, but it's a lot of cleaning and sanitizing. But you know what, though? I mean, once you get good at it, it's kind of the same thing. I have some problems with my corny kegs, not holding CO2, replace all the gaskets, but leak it. But the leak is no stop. Any advice? So where, uh, number one, do you know where the leak is coming from? Because two things. Those corny kegs um, are notorious from having kind of bent lids, right? So um, even though you've replaced the gaskets, that may not be enough. You can buy keg lube. And uh, have you ever used keg lube? So it's just basically, it's like a very, very, well, it's, it's lube, but it's also like a really thick Vaseline almost. And you put that stuff all the way around the seal, especially for the lid, because those old Pepsi kegs are really beat up. And sometimes that's your culprit. Um, also, like the, the dip uh, or the post connections can also have those little poppets on the inside. The little poppets themselves have a little gasket. So if you've replaced all those, try also adding a little bit of keg lube on those or making sure they're tight. Just homebrew, got to run cool, th good stream. Thank you. Have a good night. I appreciate you stopping in next time, man. Cheers. So, um, uh, Greg, what I would do is uh, also when it's hooked up, take a bottle of sanitizer. So I'll show you right now. I got a bottle of sanitizer right here. I take a, I always have a spray bottle in my garage of sanitizer. And when I hook up a keg, if I think there's any chance that it's leaking at all, Sometimes I can hear it, but if I if, if there's any chance, like I have one keg that's like notorious if the lid isn't on, like perfect, you know, I have to like fit it like six different ways. Then I spray the thing down while it's hooked up with, with CO2. I spray it down all over the top and stuff and look for the bubbles with, with regular CO2, star sand CO2, right? Just take it up, spray it and, uh, and do all that. But the keg lube is probably the biggest difference maker. You, sometimes you can't, 
fit it just right. And the keg lube will, will get in there and will actually stop those little small leaks. And that's going to save you from emptying out uh, CO2, which I've done before, and it sucks. Because you're having to go back and refill your whole CO2. And I have a 20-pound CO2 tank, and if I emptied that thing, I'd be pissed. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, at the same time, it's, it is what it is. You live and you learn, and you're going to make mistakes like that. But um, the keg lube, it's like five bucks. Just go buy some. It saved, saved a huge headache. If I had some here, I'd show you. It's like a little, the one I have anyway, is a little black tube. It's about yay big, got a little pencil tip on there. What I would suggest doing though is using like a rubber glove because that stuff, that's just hard to wash off. It's so, it's it's very, it's oily almost. And it, not oily, it's, it's like sticky. It's hard to get off, right? So what I would do is is wear like a rubber glove or put like something on your finger. And then um, you, you just basically put a little bit on your finger and rub it all over that uh seal and it will seal like nobody's business the next time you put on there it's great once it's seated though it should be good and so sometimes too um another uh tip i wouldn't call it pro tip because i'm not a pro but the uh another tip you can do is is ramp up the the pressure so sometimes putting like 30 pounds of pressure will help seat that lid up there really good and then you can actually back it down a little bit and it will it'll sit seated and sealed because you had a higher pressure at first uh, but but sometimes I've had to do that, but rarely. I mean, sometimes I pressure keg anyway, so it'll, it'll be at 30 for our pressure carb. So I, it'll be at 30 anyway while I'm doing that. All right, guys, what's everybody drinking and stuff? Uh, I think we went through most of the DIY stuff, though, but uh, anybody have any questions? I don't think I have anything else. I probably have more DIY stuff on my page, but uh, that's the stuff I can at least, like, see and look and be like, oh, I made that. I should probably show everybody. Anybody have any questions about anything you saw or anything cool that they want to tell me anyway? I mean, as far as the post connections, white or black? Oh, the gaskets. Well, sometimes the gaskets can be green. Like, I've had, uh, uh, like, green ones for the posts and other different colors and stuff. I, I have no idea. Most of mine are black, though. Fermenting a smoked porter. Yum. Uh, did you smoke your own malts, or did you buy a smoke malt? I've had some people, like, smoke them on the grill before. Or their smoker, or whatever, you know. And that'd be cool to do. That's a... Great future video idea, I need to remember. Smoke some malts, huh? I'm uh, thinking about doing a, a video outside when I'm brewing. Uh, I did, built a big back patio, the fire pit and TV and big outdoor living space area on my, in my backyard. So thinking about doing a video out there and uh, doing a little brew day and, Having some friends over and filming the whole damn thing would be kind of fun. Maybe do it as a live. Fourth batch of the smoke porter. Nice. How much smoke malt do you put in there? Probably not very much, huh? Probably like a pound? Maybe less? I don't know. Yeah, uh, smoke malts are pretty cool. I, I There's a couple local breweries that did a smoked, I can't remember what it was, but they did a, they, oh, that's what they did. They brought it to a, um, a barbecue place that like smokes all their meats and they kind of uh, collabed with the barbecue place and they smoked all their malts on their, uh, on their meat smoker, which is kind of cool. That's pretty neat. Uh, which spice did I use for my pumpkin ale? Ooh, good question. Don't know if I want to let all the secrets out just yet. But I will tell you, there is zero cinnamon and zero nutmeg. Um, no, I will tell you, if you stuck around this long in the live, you deserve them. So um, the, I used, let's see, I used clove, allspice, cardamom, and ginger. That's the four. So don't tell your friends. Don't have to wait to the video. 
and then I roasted pumpkin that I put in the mash. So those, I have the specific amounts and stuff that I used in each one of them in the, in the video that I'm going to do. Um, but that will be a true grain glass. That one's for many ways. I bet you it's, hold on, let's see where we're at. I can tell you. I have my uh, tilt hydrometer in there right now. And uh, I'm calling it Haunted House Pumpkin Ale. That's why I got all the Halloween decorations and stuff up, because I'm going to release that first part of October on the channel. And let me see where I got my beer stuff here. Tilt. Oh, smoke so smoke porter. Yep. Smoke porter. Good. Oh, damn. This thing's almost done. Look at that. It's sitting at... 10, 14, 69 degrees. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's pretty It's pretty darn good. Um, that went fast, because I brewed that one. When did I brew that? I guess it's been about a week. It was last Sunday. Sunday morning. Or no, it was... Uh, no, that was Friday. It could be that. It could be right. Let me look. That was... Yeah, what day did I brew this year? Twenty second. That's like two days ago. Holy cow, that thing went fast. I used this Scottish ale yeast and that thing's already down to ten fourteen. No way. There's gotta be something wrong with my tilt right now. Let me look. Well, this one doesn't say it's at. This one says it's at 10.42. Why did it say 10.14? Let me look. Let's go to. That can't be right. It's not that. It's not that low yet. It's uh, my uh, tilt in there goes to a, a different thing I have, and it's uh, saying it's only at 10.40. I was like, it's only two days. I'll be brewing on Friday. That's crazy. I think it's just, I think there might be some like fermentation action going on in there that's messing it up. Because my, uh, my spreadsheet here says it's sitting, still sitting at 1040. Anyway. So, um, I used canned, organic canned pumpkin, um, one of the cans was darker orange than the other one was, which is really weird because I mean they come from different pumpkins. I didn't use I didn't use like these, you know, I used like uh, canned pumpkin. And so, so one of them was really dark, and the other one wasn't. You'll see that in the video. Like, excuse me. So the um, I would say when you mix them together, they're about medium orange. One of them was lighter, one of them was a little bit darker, which surprised me at first. But when you I spread them out, I malted or I toasted them in the oven for a while. And then just threw them right in the mash. And somebody said uh, earlier, I think it was Victoria who was on here earlier, she said that she had a slower sparge because of it, but I did not have that issue with mine at all. And I was actually kind of paying attention to it, but I added a half pound of rice holes, and I think that really helped. Fire possum. Roush beer with smoked shag bark hickory. I do like a smoked beer, but it's got to be, like I said, it's it's like it's one, it's got to be it's got to be pretty good to go back and have more than one of them. Um, I did not measure out my uh, my stuff by grams, but I did measure them out a different way. But you're gonna have to wait, Greg, for the uh, for the recipe in like a week or so. I will. We'll have that on the channel for you. Not in a week, probably two weeks. But um, I don't remember off the top of my head how much was the measurement, but th let's put it this way. All four of those was only a tablespoon total, okay? So ginger was the most, but uh, uh, but the rest of it was less, and uh, I can't remember all of the things off the top of my head. Spruce brown by crop green fields. Farm country, man.
I did not taste the pumpkin before I put them in there, so I don't know that it darker versus lighter. Okay, it had more flavor. I have no idea. I think pumpkin is... I'm really just going for the pumpkin flavor of the beer, but how do you know what, what can would have darker pumpkin in it? I don't know. I have no idea. I just used two cans off the shelf. Or, uh, excuse me, I used three pounds. One was a two-pound can, one was a one-pound can, but two cans total, but three pounds. Eight point five percent. That'll hit you. Oh, it's. Oh, never mind. Now you say it's six. All right, guys. Anybody got any last-minute questions and things? We're gonna be. Uh, I went through all the DIY stuff. Um, I like all the questions, though. Keep them coming, man. I, I underneath videos. It doesn't matter which one. Just send me a message. Again, if you want free stickers, I didn't bring any stickers with me tonight, but I had some last night. They look like this little, this guy right here except for they got a little QR code on the bottom uh, so you can share them with friends and get them to Cityscape Brewing. But uh, if you have a, if you want some stickers, uh, email me. I'll send them to you for free. So you can email me at cityscapebrew at gmail.com, cityscapebrew at gmail. I'll send you some stickers in the mail, and uh, you can give them away to your friends and stuff. If you have some you want to swap, let me know, and uh, we can swap some stickers too. No. I don't think the cans from, came from the same pumpkin. They were on totally different, you know, racks of, of, of canned pumpkin. Even though the same, if they're the same brand, but they're the two pound cans versus the one pound cans. So, no. Um, I like to think they were all the same family pumpkins. Like, one was the mom pumpkin and then the bigger can is probably the dad pumpkin. Does that help? What's my favorite base malt? Ooh, if I was doing it, oh, okay, so that's a that's a if. So if I was doing it by itself for like a Cascade, or a, excuse me, for like a Smash Beer, I would say Marisano. But if I was doing any other regular base malt, I would say Pilsner. I mean, two-row and Pilsner are the same, but I like Pilsner a little better than for a regular base malt. Um, I don't know why. I just make generally better beer when I use Pilsner as a base malt than two-row. Yes, I... You ever see that Halloween movie where they're, like, pumpkins and one's, like, the square pumpkin and it, like, feels different? I hope my can was the square pumpkin after they caught his ass and, like, really chopped him up and got him, and I hope I made a beer out of him. Marisad is a good one. It adds a little body to the malt and uh, and uh, it gives a little more like of a biscuity flavor. So it's a, it's a good one. I don't know that I would use it for like a, like a, some of my sours that I want to be light on purpose, but uh, it's a great one to use for a lot of different beers. Hey, thanks guys. I appreciate you guys uh, jumping on tonight. I'm going to head out. I hope you guys have a good one. If you have any other questions, uh, Feel free uh, to ask them. Um, I'm going to get the, the comments after this, even uh, when we get, get off session here. But also, uh, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. I appreciate each and every one of you guys. You guys are awesome. Uh, Golden Promise, by the way, is a great uh, base malt. Uh, I just used that in the pumpkin ale, so that's another secret. Or no, I didn't use that in the pumpkin ale. I used, I'm using that in the next hazy I'm doing. That's what we're doing. So we're going to try that one. But Golden Promise is uh, very similar to Turo. But... Anyway, have a great night, you guys. I uh, appreciate everyone jumping on and uh, helping support the channel. Uh, see you guys later. And, uh, again, I'm not going to be on next week, but I will be on in two weeks. So, uh, book I recommend for learning. Um, real quickly, that would be uh, The Godfather of Homebrewing himself. Uh, oh, man, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Why am I drawing a blank on his name? Someone, someone can help me out. I will get back to the Greg, uh, but yes, that uh, there is a book that I can uh, I'll send you a, a comment on that because uh, I think that's a good good question. See so you guys. Uh, I'm not not going to be on next Sunday. Two weeks from now, two weeks from now, uh, not next Sunday. I'm not going to be on on October fourth or October first. I will be on a week from then, uh, two weeks from now. So send me some comments if you want to learn about something specific. But hope you guys have a good night. Uh, cheers.